Awesome. So welcome everybody to this afternoon's webinar, Diminishing Hardware Returns and Smart Equipment Shopping, hosted by NACAD and presented by Josh Knutson with Bytespeed. We're excited for what's going on today. Josh is going to do most of the talking presenting here. I'm just serving as, for those who don't know me, one of the members of the leadership team on NACAD. Uh, we've been partners with Byte Speed for several years now. Uh, I, in my role as an esports director, have worked with Byte Speed um, through our esports program. So we're excited about what they're going to share today. Pumped about what Josh is going to hand down to us from the knowledge standpoint. So <laughs> with with that, Josh, I'll kind of hand it to you and let you take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Cole. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here and let's make sure I grab the right one. Um, all right. And I apologize for everybody. I've got a 12 week old puppy in the background that does not like being in his kennel. Uh, so if you hear some barking and, and whining, that's uh, Gus making his presence known. Um, but the, the reason we're all here today is definitely for the do's and don'ts uh, and kind of some just best practices on, on hardware. And, and this is definitely uh, want to give a special shout out to Intel for helping us with uh, partnership between Bytespeed and NACAD and helping kind of make some of these things happen. Um, so as we get into it, just a, a little bit about my, me and uh, kind of my background. Uh, I started out in, in a lot of your guys' shoes. Uh, I was the former head coaching program director at the University of Jamestown here in North Dakota. Uh, it's a small school in the middle of nowhere, but uh, we were one of the first 20 colleges roughly uh, to start a varsity style uh, collegiate esports program way back in 2016. Um, I was fortunate enough to, uh, you know, run and, and, you know, work with that program for three and a half years. Uh, and then I joined Bytespeed as the director of Gravity Gaming here in uh, 2019. Um, so I actually just had my four year anniversary here at Bytespeed uh, at the beginning of this month. So it's been a, a crazy whirlwind, but it's been fun to see kind of both sides of things playing out. Uh, both from a customer side, you know, a, as a customer looking for hardware and, and doing the shopping myself, and also working on the industry side and having solutions available and being able to work with colleges and kind of educate on, you know, how you get the best for, for your situation and for your program. Um, I'm also an advisory board member uh, with NACAD. I have been since the very beginning. Uh, it's been super cool to watch this organization grow, and I'm really excited about the, the future and kind of where things are headed. Uh, and, uh, you know, as recently as last year, uh, I jumped on with Marshalltown Community College, also uh, an Iowa college, um, as part of their advisory program for their esports team. So I'm not, you know, running a team day to day, but I get to kind of see behind the curtain on uh, one of the programs that uh, are, are thriving and really doing some cool things on the academic side in the college world. So um, all my contact info is here on the screen, email, phone, discord, you name it. Uh, reach out the best way you can. Uh, if you have questions or we don't get to something that you were curious about today, uh, absolutely I'm available uh, all the time. Everything's connected to my cell phone. So you'll get me one way or the other. Um, and definitely want to make sure that uh, we cover everything that you guys might have questions about today. So um, Again, this is going to be definitely like a, um, a a buyer's guide or like a how to maximize what we're doing on the equipment side of things, right? Um, it's the summertime. A lot of colleges and high schools uh, refresh hardware over the summer months. You know, your fiscal year might end uh, at the end of June and you're getting ready to get started again up in, in the fall season. Uh, we want to make sure that our labs or our, our facilities are, are up to snuff and have the equipment that we need to be successful. But what actually is important in kind of making those decisions and, and, and working through that exercise, right? Uh, a lot of times it comes down to like the three big pillars of, of what is actually important here. Number one is always budget. Um, you know, 99% of the schools out there, whether you're a high school or a college, where, you know, we're working with limited resources. It's just not like I can go out to the money tree and, and grab whatever I want and, and buy whatever hardware that I need. And, 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 you know, that's the end of it, right? We're working with some constraints and we got to balance the performance and longevity of those machines uh, to, to be able to get, you know, our dollars to stretch as far as they can. Um, so, you know, are we staying in budget with the overall build of a machine or with peripherals or whatever we might be looking at? Uh, and are we staying competitive? Are these machines going to be doing what we need, um, you know, in the present day when we're 
competing against other schools across the country? Uh, and also, are they going to be doing their job, you know, three, four, five years down the line until my next, you know, purchase happens on the hardware side when I can refresh those devices? Um, so a lot of the, the education that we do at Bytespeed and, and working with schools through NACAD is just kind of having this conversation of, you know, how can you find the best configuration for your machines and get the most out of that uh, configuration long term. Um, so I will kind of start things off with a little bit of an analogy that I can't take credit for. This actually comes from uh, one of our network engineers here at Bytespeed. His name's Robert Ogan. Uh, but he, he kind of likes to say that PCs are like an office in the grand scheme of things. And, and that starts with the CPU, the processor. Um, this is like the, the main unit of the PC. You can think of it as like the central office in a business. And the cores are, you know, bosses that actually process data. Uh, however, those bosses can't actually go and grab stuff out of the filing cabinets. They're, they're not walking the floors and, and finding information uh, to make their decisions with. We actually have to bring that data from another place in the computer and give it to the CPU to be able to take with it from there. Uh, so that's where memory comes in. Uh, memory or RAM, these are the workers that, you know, they can't actually process data, but they can go retrieve it from the storage, from the SSDs, the hard drives, things like that, and actually bring it to the processor to, you know, figure out what task needs to happen. Um, storage, you can think of those, like I said, those drives are the filing cabinets where data is stored, where operations are stored, uh, and where things, you know, when, when we're executing a file or we're opening up a game or loading into something, um, that's got to be stored somewhere. It's, it's a, a manila envelope and a file on the other side of the office, and the RAM has to go get it and bring it to the processor to be able to actually do something with that data. Um, your GPUs, these are like the field reps. They're taking orders from the CPUs uh, and they're taking that and actually going out and pushing it out into the wild. Uh, a lot of times working with like a display to actually show what we're doing. Um, so these are like the main components of a, a PC, of a gaming computer. Uh, and we'll talk about each one of these kind of individually and kind of expand on their jobs and how we evaluate them as individual components in a larger build. Uh, and then kind of like, like I said, the last thing uh, displays, because there is some kind of neat data here. Uh, they're showing the finished product, they're showing that task, uh, and they're they're taking the, uh, the assignment from the GPU. So uh, let's get into processors here a little bit and talk more about what those, you know, how things kind of stack up against each other. Um, so like I said, processors, they're the, the bosses in the office or that central office in, in the building. And the cores are the bosses that are actually, you know, doing something with data. Um, their speed is often represented by gigahertz, and it's usually a range. It might be like 2.1 to 4.0 or something like that. That's how fast they can work individually. Uh, and the number of cores is the number of bosses that there are in that office. So if I'm a, a hexacore processor, it's me and five other guys sitting in an office, you know, taking in that information processing it and then sending it out to other parts of the computer to, to do that. Um, so this is really important when we talk about multi-purpose machines that need to do, you know, some kind of multitasking, whether it's, you know, when we're rendering uh, stuff through like a Photoshop or a Premiere Pro or, or you know, some kind of digital artist uh, station, or maybe it's a, an engineering machine or something that's running AutoCAD or, or some other processes or, or maybe even streaming. Uh, where we have gameplay happening at one side of the computer and we've got streaming and, and encoding and, and actually uploading on, on the other sides. Um, so in those cases, in those multi-purpose cases, more cores often means, you know, you can do more in a shorter amount of time. Um, however, when we talk about just strict gaming performance, most esports titles, most of the games that you guys are playing in your schools right now, whether it's college or high school, those titles take very little advantage uh, of multi-cores. A lot of times it's very, very few cores that are actually being engaged to play that game. Uh, and it's more of the GPU that's doing the heavy lifting. And we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Um, so in the context of just gaming performance, more does not always mean better. Uh, but, you know, if you're doing streaming or, or video editing or things like that, like we said, multi-purpose, multitasking, uh, the number of cores and, and how fast those cores can operate does make a difference. So it's a lot of really technical speak. So how do we put this into practice? How do we look at, you know, different 
processors and, and kind of make a decision on what's right for us. Um, this is a, a benchmark out of a Gamers Nexus uh, YouTube video from a couple months ago. Uh, and, and I like it because it's got a couple of different things that we can look at. And it, it has a lot of different processors stacked up side by side. Um, this is a little overwhelming. So let me get rid of half of it so that we can kind of contextualize things a little bit easier. Um, with this chart, the, the different bars and the numbers are the things that we're going to look at when we're evaluating performance. Um, so that blue line, that's your average FPS out of just, just the straight processor, right? So your average FPS on that Ryzen 9 7950X, that very top of the screen, that, you know, the average is 435.9 frames per second. That's incredible. It's a great CPU, tons of performance. And you might be thinking, man, that, that looks pretty cool. I would love to have that in some of my builds. However, when we look at this chart, we need to also pay attention to the red and the orange lines, which are the 1% lows and the 0.01% lows. Uh, and essentially what those are is at its worst, how is this processor performing under load? Um, so it, you know, if you think of when you're playing a game, and you get that, you know, every once in a while you get a stutter or a, a jitter uh, or, you know, it feels like the game's not loading or, you know, you get a frame drop or something like that. That is, you know, those orange and red lines coming into play um, when, the, when the processor or the video card or whatever has to, you know, catch back up and it's running at its, you know, quote unquote, worst level of performance. So on this chart, what we want to see is, yes, high numbers are better, but more consistent, more closely packed lines or, or numbers are, you know, more or more desirable in what we look for in a CPU. Um, so while that, you know, that 7950X at the very top looks incredible with that 435.9 number way out in front, uh, the disparity or the range from its average to its worst is huge. Uh, if we're looking at 158 frames on the low end to 435 on the high end, that's a giant range. That's not very consistent. So what I'm drawn to when I look at this, this graph are, you know, the Ryzen 5 7600X and then, are, you know, Intel i5 13600K. These have super great averages, but more consistent or closer together 1% lows and 0.01% lows. Uh, and, you know, another thing to kind of point out is, you know, going back to that thought of like, okay, evaluating where this stacks up against other uh, processors and different generations or, or different models. If you look at this i5 compared to the i9, uh, that 12900K from just the generation before it, look at how close these are. Uh, you have the, the 13th gen i5 at 365 frames. And the previous gen i9, the cream of the crop, is only at 375. So there's only 10 frames difference in their averages. And then when you look at, you know, the 1% lows, essentially the same. And the 0.01% lows, that worst case scenario, you have actually the current generation i5 outperforming the previous generation i9. And this is even more impactful when we talk about cost per frame. Um, and this is a hardware unboxed uh, graph that I'm going to steal from also from YouTube. They're a great outlet that does uh, performance comparisons all the time. Um, again, a lot of the same processors, a lot of the same parts from the last graph just kind of arranged in, you know, what is my cost per frame in, in this piece of hardware? So let's get rid of some of it so that we can kind of easier look at this graph. And if I, you know, bring back the, the ones that we were looking at before that Ryzen 5 and the i5, um, you can really start to see where, you know, the better deals are overall when it comes to cost of individual parts. Um, so that i5, you know, the one that I, I you know, mentioned, hey, is outperforming the previous gen i9. For $330, you're getting 175 average, you know, frames per second. Uh, and then that i9 towards the, the bottom here, $500 for less of an average, 170 versus 175, uh, and almost double the cost per frame uh, of what that processor, uh, you know, is pumping out. So these are the things, you know, whether it's uh, current generation hardware, whether we're talking about CPUs, GPUs, I, the list goes on and on. This is the kind of exercise that I, we really just want to educate people on how to evaluate things. Uh, because when you look at, okay, you know, the i9 sounds cool. Uh, it, it is a, a flagship product. It's something that if I put inside my machine, I can brag about that. 
but is it worth the extra $170 per machine to get there when I can save a little bit of money, get better performance? And yeah, sure, like i5 doesn't sound as cool, but is that the better direction for my program to go when it's time to purchase hardware? So these, these, it's all about being a smart shopper, right? So uh, that i5 absolutely is a rock star. We actually use that in a ton of builds right now. Uh, it's price has come down since this graph was actually uh, made. Like I said, this is data from like kind of March timeline. Um, so it's a little, it, it's two months old, uh, but still this kind of same exercise or the same process of evaluating is, is the important part. Uh, and, and I personally, you know, if I was back at Jamestown looking at how I can, you know, push my program forward and get the best bang for my buck, that i5 13600K is where I want to spend my money. Um, so same kind of exercise moving into graphics cards. Um, again, this is kind of like the biggest factor when it comes to true gaming performance. The graphics cards are going to take the biggest load. They're going to do the most work when it comes to playing games. Um, you know, they're tested on rasterization, which is just a fancy word for rendering. And again, we're judged on that same criteria of frames per second. Um, the other thing to mention is that you want to pair your graphics card with a monitor that's capable of pushing those frames out. Um, there are a, a ton of instances where, you know, we might be building a really awesome mid to high end system on a gaming side. Uh, and then, you know, we hear from a school like, oh, you know, we, we already have monitors, don't worry about it. And we bring up the fact that like, hey, that 60 Hertz monitor is only gonna go so far. If you're gonna spend, you know, all this money on a gaming PC, you wanna make sure that the other components of your setup are able to kind of work hand in hand and be able to actually show you what you're buying on the performance side. Uh, so make sure when you're looking at graphics cards and the overall build of your system, make sure that the monitors aren't something that you forget about uh, and that you know whatever hertz refresh rate uh, that, that you choose will line up more with kind of what you're spending on, on the actual PC side. And we'll talk about monitors and refresh rate in a little bit because that's kind of a fun fun little thing to look through. Uh, but back to our gamers nexus stuff right this uh, screenshot was taken right after the 4070 ti came out so again it's a couple months old uh, but still very relevant in kind of how we go about this process um, so i'll get rid of some of the info just so that we can kind of look at number one our, our you know biggest baddest graphics card on the market at the time was the 4090 677 frames a second that's awesome right top of the food chain but again that top of the food chain, not as consistent as some of these cards here in the middle. That 402 at the absolute worst sat, you know, performance rating for that 4090 compared to its average of 677, it's a huge range, it's almost 300 frames per second. Whereas, you know, looking at, you know, your 3070, your 3060 TIs, uh, you know, even the 4070, a lot closer of a gap. You're talking, you know, 100 frames, sometimes less than that one way or the other. Uh, and definitely more economical when it comes to, you know, using your dollars in a smart and, you know, effective way. Uh, so if we go on to the next, you know, the next slide here and go back to our cost per frame section uh, and we get rid of some of the, some of the extras here, um, take a look at, at this chart and where things line up. And again, you know, I'm going to call out two specific models here, the 3070 and the 3060 Ti, uh, specifically with how they arrange and stack up against other cards in their price range, or in some cases, the performance of what is much more expensive than, than what they're costing. Um, so the 3060 Ti, you know, $400, we're averaging 106 frames per second. It's pretty good. It's really good value, you know, $3.77 per frame if you do the math compared to something like a 3060, just a, a base 3060, you know, for 60 cents more, you're getting a better deal overall, just with kind of how the, the per frame cost shakes out, but you're also increasing your average, you know, by 20 frames a second. Uh, for $60, that's a pretty good investment to make. Uh, and that's where maybe some of the money that we saved on the processor, we can dump into going that half step up uh, on the graphics card side. Um, and then the 3070 also, you know, just kind of showcasing for, you know, I, I, $90 less than the 3070 Ti. Uh, you're only losing eight frames a second, but you're getting a much better value, uh, almost 40 cents 
per frame better uh, by just kind of going that half step down and saving some money. Uh, and then, you know, another kind of fun thing to look at, especially on the high end side, because uh, there are definitely people that that uh, want to build that spaceship of a computer. Uh, you can see just how much more efficient we've gotten in generational leaps. The 3090 Ti, you know, last generation's biggest, baddest graphics card, you know, 168 frames per second, $1,500, you know, $8.93 per frame. The 4090, Yes, it's a two thousand dollar graphics card, uh, but sixty cents cheaper per frame and a giant performance leap. Um, so it's kind of cool. Like I said, not many people are shopping for these high high end cards for collegiate or high school esports. You know, we're more in the range of these kind of mid to entry level cards. Uh, but it's fun to kind of take a look and, and apply this kind of exercise to you know any different product in the stack, whether we're looking at low end GPUs, high end processors, things like that. It, it's kind of fun to be able to see where things stack up uh, and kind of use that, like what is actually important here, budget, performance, and longevity. Um, so those, you know, G CPUs and GPU is definitely the most relevant when we're looking at overall cost of a machine, overall spec of a machine, uh, but they're not the only parts of the of the PC that we need to care about, right? So RAM, going back to actually moving data from storage to CPU to get processed. Uh, for gaming, you know, there's a couple of just real quick hitters that we want to talk about. Um, benchmarking RAM is really, really difficult. Uh, just because uh, the, the differences between, you know, 8, 16, 32 gigs is, is marginal based on what you're actually doing. Um, so software complexity, you know, available bandwidth, uh, GPU cores are, are more hungry than they ever have been. Um, so memory speed, it, it does matter at the end of the day. Uh, and, and some things to kind of keep in mind or kind of best practices that we as a manufacturer and a system builder would say is that dual channel number one is always preferable to just a single stick of RAM. Um, so if you're going with 16 gigs of memory, you want two eight gig sticks. Uh, if you're gonna go 64 gigs of memory, do two 32 gig sticks uh, and have things running in dual channel so that you get the most out of those pieces of hardware. Eight gigs, absolutely the bare minimum, a lot of times for gaming. Uh, we don't see a lot of systems with eight gigs of RAM anymore. Um, you know, four years ago when I started at Bytespeed, we did kind of bottom shelf or kind of entry level systems with eight gigs. Uh, but memory has gotten really cheap over the last few years. Uh, so 16 is kind of the sweet spot and the gold standard for, for most, you know, gaming builds. Um, after that, you know, when we talk about diminishing returns, 32 gigs for gaming, not really necessary. Um, for multitasking, streaming, doing more uh, of kind of the background processes, absolutely, it's a nice to have. Um, it allows for more data to be transferred faster uh, and lets you, you know, get more out of your machine. Uh, and like I said, RAM and storage too have gotten so cheap and so inexpensive to upgrade that a lot of what we see is even your entry level systems are going for 16 gigs uh, and a lot more just, you know, choosing to do the $25, $50 it takes to bump that up to 32 gigs. Uh, but for a really long time and still, you know, you know for a, a lot of things, uh, 16 gigs is your sweet spot. Uh, and RAM really only factors into your FPS or what you see on the screen when we talk about those worst case scenarios. Uh, so this is a, a, just a, a really quick benchmark, you know, CSGO at 1080. And it really just is a demonstration of that single versus dual channel where even, you know, if we're sticking with eight gigs of RAM, but in dual channel mode, that two by four configuration, much better for performance than just a, a single stick of memory. Uh, and then again, kind of also demonstrated it that two by eight, uh, that, that third, you know, bar there at the bottom. Um, when we talk about storage, uh, you know, hard drives, spinning hard drives, uh, you know, your mass storage is kind of a thing of the past when it comes to esports builds. Uh, so we're moving a lot more into solid state versus M.2. Uh, those are all form factors. You know, your hard drive is like the old 7200 RPM, you know, Seagate drive that's stuck in a machine and stores a couple terabytes worth of data where your solid states, you know, your, your, um, PCIe connected devices uh, are much faster and much more efficient in how they move data and how they store data. Um, storage helps with asset loading. Uh, you know, when we're looking at esports titles, uh, a couple of things to remember is that you know most of the time 
we're not playing triple a games that have you know tons and tons and tons of detail in every square foot that you're walking in the game uh a lot of times your esports titles like Valorant or Overwatch, League of Legends, they're you know a little less textured. There's not as fine detail uh, put in there. It's a lot more simple. Uh, and those assets, you know, if we're working with a solid state or an M.2 form factor, uh, are, are able to be you know loaded very quickly uh, and accessed by the PC uh, extremely efficiently. Um, you know, the size of the application definitely the biggest consideration when you're talking about how much storage to put into a PC. Um, you know, we don't have a, a, a graph to go along with this, but uh, Windows installs, definitely something to think about. Uh, Microsoft is as big as it's ever been, uh, as far as like how much space on your computer it takes up. Uh, and then also, you know, how many titles are you playing? How many, you know, different games does your program support? You know, if we're just working with, you know, like your uh, League of Legends, Overwatch, Rocket League, kind of core three, um, you don't need a ton of space for, for those game titles. Uh, but if I'm, you know, a, a program like uh, my alma mater, University of Jamestown, they're supporting eight different titles throughout the year. Takes a lot of storage or, or you know, it starts to add up the more titles and more games that you play and support. Um, most of the time we tend to, to move people over towards a terabyte of storage per PC. Um, and again, storage has gotten so cheap that the, the difference between 500 meg or 500 gig, excuse me, uh, where we used to be for a lot of our builds uh, and that terabyte of storage is, you know, sometimes as cheap as $25. So it's a, a really cost effective way to upgrade your overall machine. Uh, and then, like I said, yeah, 500 gigs is usually good. Terabyte is becoming uh, the standard for storage. Uh, and again, it's it's cheap. Um, another, you know, very important thing to look at in, in the overall, you know, configuration of a PC as a power supply. Um, the, the quality efficiency rating, this 80 plus bronze, gold, platinum, titanium, uh, that is how efficient, you know, that power supply is at maintaining 80% of its efficiency under load. Um, so, you know, you want to save money long term with how efficient your power supply is. Uh, so it's an important thing to consider. Um, gold certified is definitely like what we recommend you shoot for. Um, it's just a, a big difference between bronze and gold level power supplies. Um, gives you a longer lifespan, more headroom for future upgrades, uh, you know, adding in more drives or maybe we change over the cooling system, at, you know, down the road or we add in different graphics cards. Having a, a more, a higher certified power supply definitely helps uh, and having more headroom on the wattage side of things will let you, you know, extend the life of your machine. Um, so a, a cool, you know, thing to, to just kind of showcase what the difference between bronze, gold, platinum and titanium is, is a 600 watt 80 plus bronze power supply consumes 41 watts more power than the next step up when it full load. And that might not sound like a lot, but 41 watts is a ton when you compare gold to platinum is a savings of like 12 to 16 watts uh, over the, the course of an hour or over the course of the lifespan, right? So the cost difference between bronze and gold, not that much, but you're getting a big efficiency standard. Uh, and then gold to platinum, you're starting to shrink the, the differences that you're getting and the cost is definitely increasing. Um, some platinum and titanium power supplies go for two, three hundred dollars, uh, depending on what you're looking at. Whereas, like a gold, uh, a really solid eighty plus gold will run you, you know, a hundred, hundred and twenty dollars. Um, so, in, in some cases, you know, you're spending ten, fifteen, twenty dollars more than a bronze, but you're getting a big savings long term with the wattage that you're saving. Uh, and you know that jump to platinum or titanium might not be worth the extra hundred or two hundred dollars per system. Uh, right. And then last kind of monitors, the last piece of the puzzle here. Um, you know, again, refresh rate and response time are kind of the two things to really look at in a good gaming setup. Um, you know, how quickly does that monitor actually show new frames or process that data and let you see it on screen? Um, so fun little exercise here. Uh, a 60 hertz monitor shows a new frame on that screen every 16 and a half milliseconds, which sounds fast, but if anybody's played uh, a video game or, or something where, you know, frames win games, you know, we kind of hear that. Uh, if you've played that first person shooter on a 60 hertz monitor, 
it is rough uh, sometimes, right? So the difference between 60 and the next jump up, which is typically like 144 frames per second, is 10 milliseconds. It is a huge jump in performance uh, for you know about $100 uh, for that, that jump up from 60 hertz to 144. Uh, most of the gaming monitors that we see in this range are kind of between 200 and 250, 275 dollars, depending on kind of you know what the bells and whistles of that monitor and the warranty are. Uh, but it's a huge, huge performance jump to go from 60, which is like your normal office monitor, to 144 hertz, which is kind of like where we start to hear the word gaming monitor in. Now the next jump up from 144 to 240 hertz. We're only shaving off two milliseconds, two and a half milliseconds if we're being generous, right? That price jump to go from 144 to 240 is again, another $100, $150, depending on the brand, the spec, the size of monitor that we're talking about. So whereas the, the upgrade from 60 to 144 is absolutely worth our money and worth doing, we have to start to think a little bit harder about that jump from 144 to 240. Now, we are seeing kind of a trend, especially in the college world, where most schools are moving towards 240 hertz monitors. Uh, and that's definitely, you know, on the performance side, um, you know, gaming hardware has gotten a lot better. You know, your graphics cards are able to push that higher range of frames more consistently, where in previous generations, you know, 144 hertz was about, you know, as good as it got. So 240 is kind of becoming the standard at the top level of, of, you know, of play. Um, now, if anybody in the chat is saying, okay, you know, yes, we're, we're still going with 240, but I've heard of 350 Hertz monitors out there. Not even a whole two sec, two milliseconds getting shaved off to go to that 360, which is the next jump up. Uh, and again, 360 Hertz monitors, um, we start getting into like the $450, $500 range for those monitors. Whereas we're starting to see some big diminishing returns on the, the amount of money these are costing to the performance that we're getting. And also factoring in like the human eye can only see so far. So, uh, you know, there have been other monitors that have been released in the last, you know, six to 12 months that go even beyond that 360 hertz. Uh, but I, I really doubt that we'll see, you know, esports level uh, play, you know, and, and colleges and high schools ever even come close to touching uh, some of the stuff that's past 360. Um, the gold standard that we've told people for a very, very long time is look for a 24 inch monitor that hits that 144 hertz and like a millisecond response time. And that's going to be like your gold standard for gaming. Uh, and that gives you 19 by 20 uh, by 1080. Uh, it's kind of the, the best resolution for benchmarking, for maximizing performance. Your competition settings are going to be at that size. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, as big as you really need to get. Um, you know, we hear arguments for like 27 inch monitors or 34 inch monitors, uh, looking at bigger aspect ratios and things like that. Uh, and that actually can impact your performance and actually seeing like how much can you see on a monitor, but also like if I click in an area that's a little bit past my normal resolution, is that actually where my cursor is going or is it kind of filling in the blanks with uh, kind of that distorted aspect ratio. So 24 inch for competition is definitely what we what we recommend. Um, so when we go and, and build out a config using everything that we've learned today, uh, you know, using those kind of evaluation practices, you know, if I was building a system, you know, best bang for my buck for a high school, for college, that i5 13600K definitely is what I would lean towards where I would start, right? Um, benchmarks better than the previous Gen i9 for almost $200 cheaper. Graphics card, we go back to that 3060 Ti. Uh, 20% higher for just $60 more than the step below it. Uh, so worth my upgrade there. Uh, a 16 gig, 16 gig dual channel kit for RAM. Uh, and then my power supply, 750 watt, 80 plus gold, get that really good efficiency rating without way overspending on something like a platinum or a titanium level power supply. Um, that gold rated power supply is going to take care of me for well beyond, you know, three, four, five years that we'll have this machine in commission. Uh, and then storage, you know, go for a terabyte of M.2 storage uh, and uh, 144 hertz monitor. 
And this is uh, what I would consider like a gold standard uh, for, for building a esports level PC right now. Uh, James O'Hagan just jumping in, in in the chat here saying 3060 Ti has been one of my best purchases ever for a PC. Uh, proof's in the pudding. Uh, it's been one of the best selling cards uh, that Bytespeed has seen. Uh, in the last, you know, generations, especially. Uh, and, you know, we're actually even seeing with some of the benchmarking that we've seen and done on some of the new 40 series cards, that 3060 Ti is actually still punching above like a 4060 Ti in some cases. Uh, and it looks like it's going to be a really relevant card moving forward. So it's kind of fun to, to do that kind of exercise and say, okay, you know, cost, performance, how's it stack up to new stuff? Um, that's really all I got, guys. I, you know, it's a quick and dirty kind of really technical webinar here, but I hope it's kind of shown um, some of the people that might not be as technical, uh, you know, collegiate and high school directors uh, may or may not have IT backgrounds, right? A lot of schools will go and tap the history teacher on the shoulder and say, hey, we're doing esports, go figure it out. Uh, and you might not have that really technical background to know when we're evaluating quotes from vendors and, and specs when we're looking at, you know, machines and, and dollars and how far our budgets are going to go for the next year. Um, you know, I, I really feel like it's important to kind of peel back the curtain a little bit and show uh, some of those non-technical people and even, you know, somebody that's been around the PC world for a while, uh, just kind of how to look at specs a little bit deeper and understand kind of why you know, a bite speed might quote this, or, or you know, you might have a, a CDW quoting that. Um, it's just a, kind of a really cool exercise and, and something that you can apply to a lot of different things and not just PC hardware, uh, but really just looking, comparing uh, stuff in, in whether it's performance ranges or cost ranges, uh, and just being a smart shopper overall. So um, if you have questions or, or didn't get to anything that you're curious about here on the webinar today, uh, all my contact info is here on the screen. Would love to connect with you after. Uh, and just really appreciate the partnership with NACAD. Uh, thanks so much for, for letting us jump in and kind of spread some knowledge here as we get into the summer months. And uh, really excited to see everybody in Boise uh, next week for the national convention or a week from, yeah, a week from now. So yep. one week from now. Perfect. Josh, I do want to hit you with one question for the crowd before we send it to everybody out here because you, you sure. touched on it a little bit. So you kind of showed your, your gold standard, right? For we talked primarily about a competition speed, uh, PC. Mm -hmm. as, as streaming gets bigger and bigger for more and more programs, both at the high school and the collegiate level. Yeah. If you were going to take, you know, what's your order of priority with components in that gold standard, right? You could upgrade one piece to improve the streaming side of things or two pieces. Where, where do you work your way down? Sure, yeah. So the, the streaming setups, we look at graphics card power or graphics card processor and RAM. Those would be kind of like where your biggest bang for your buck would come from, kind of in that order. Um, you can still stream with 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, 32 is kind of like a nice to have, um, but I would focus more on GPU first to be able to handle, especially if you're doing like multiple inputs uh, and you know having to process a ton of visual data. Um, your graphics card first and then your your cpu second uh looking at higher core count higher thread count um you know speed and, and gigahertz is kind of overrated until you get into like really really high sure. level technical stuff um so what we recommend you know for a streaming build is like look at your 3060 ti 3070 ti graphics cards uh, and, and kind of up and then jump up to like that i7, that Ryzen 7. Uh, usually those are kind of like really good half steps to move up. It won't, you know, break the bank on one system. You know, you're talking two, three hundred dollars more expensive on average from your normal kind of base config. Uh, and then you can kind of go from there and that'll really take care of you on the streaming side. Perfect. Perfect. All right. That's the only thing I wanted to hit. But yeah, if cool. you have questions like Josh said, follow up with him and Hopefully we'll see you all at the national convention. Awesome. Thanks everybody.